In our continued exploration of basic meteorological concepts, we're going to talk a little bit about radiation this week, specifically black body radiation and the Planck function. Welcome to another MetPi Monday. Hello, I'm John Lehman, a software engineer for Unidata. This week we're going to look at the Planck function, of course, from the famous German physicist Max Planck, and what it has to do with black body radiation. So a black body is a surface that absorbs all the radiation incident to it in a perfect world. And we can look at radiation emitted by the black body as a function of its temperature using the Planck function. So specifically, I'm looking at figures 4.6 and figures 4.7a in the Atmospheric Science book by Wallace and Hobbes. These figures were particularly interesting to me, and I thought it would be nice to be able to interact with them some, maybe change the temperatures that are plotted, and just get a little better understanding of them by actually creating them. So here's the Planck function. I've typed it up in LaTeX. There's the tech code if you're curious and want to see. Of course, it, you just use a markdown cell and enclose it in dollar signs and type your LaTeX code. And we get that. So we need to code up a black body radiation or Planck function because we don't actually have much radiation functionality in MetPy. So I'm going to do my imports. Matplotlib. NumPy, and we need units, and I'm going to create a black body radiation function that takes temperature, and the wavelength, or lambda, that's in this equation uh, that we want to calculate the radiation at, I'm going to define a minimum with a default of 0 0.01 micron and a maximum with a default of 2 micron. And the number of steps that I want to do my calculation in will default to 100. There are two constants, C1 and C2, in this equation. C1 is 3.74 times 10 to the minus 16. Then we need to make sure we do units because this is going to ensure that we're doing our calculation correctly. It's watt square meters. C2 is 1.45 times 10 to the minus 2 units meter Kelvin. Now one potential complication I could see is somebody setting the maximum or minimum wavelength and using a different unit but not setting both. So I'm going to just ensure that my maximum wavelength is in the units of our minimum wavelength. Just make sure it's a sanity check for us that everything is in the right unit. Now the wavelength that we're going to calculate at, we're going to use NumPy's lens space to go from Wmin. We have to take the magnitude here to drop those units. I'm going to do that in n steps. And then we're going to assign units again. The actual radiation is just our formula. So C1 times wavelength to the minus fifth power divided by pi times E to the C2 divided by wavelength times temperature minus one. And make sure we've got all of our parentheses closed there. Now I want to return the wavelength that we did our calculation at, or the wavelengths in this case, and the radiation. So let's see if this works. I'm going to get a wavelength and a radiation from our black body radiation function. Uh, let's say 5,000 units 
dot Kelvin, and it'll just make a quick plot. Okay, this is indeed the correct shape for the function. I'm not so sure about the numeric values right now. These look very small. And in fact, when I first started trying to reproduce this figure, it took me a second. Uh, but we know our function is working, we think. So let's go ahead and try to reproduce figure 4.6, which has three different temperatures plotted on the same plot. Plot.subplots for temperature and color in zip. And we'll go through the array of 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 Kelvin. And the colors are going to be light salmon, salmon, and crimson, just because sometimes I enjoy looking through the named colors. Close our parentheses for zip. This should be familiar to us using our black body radiation function. On a temperature, axe.plot. We'll label it with the temperature. Let's use our color that we specified. And we're done. We'll add a legend. Okay, so looking at the shape of the curves, they match what I see in the book figure. They're in the right place. As we go to a higher temperature, the peak is higher and shifts further to the left on my plot, indicating shorter wavelength or higher frequency radiation, which we know makes sense. But those units still don't seem quite right. In fact, this is a very small number, 1 times 10 to the minus 17. And meter square times watt per micron to the fifth doesn't seem incredibly useful. If we look at the plot in the book, though, we see that they've converted it to a megawatt, so talking quite a bit of energy there, per meter square per micron. So we're looking at a watt per square meter per micron across this curve. And then they have per steradian, which of course is an angular unit of area. Now we can go ahead and put that in here just to match their plot, but of course steradians are dimensionless, so we can multiply, divide, do whatever we want with them, and not really affect the dimensional analysis of this. But now, just by doing this conversion, we instantly get numbers that are lining up with what we see in our book. So we've now reproduced that figure. We could, of course, go and change the captions to be exactly like that figure. But my goal here is to say, do I understand the concept enough? And yes, I can code the equation correctly. I can match it to a reference, which itself has a reference to a 1963 paper. So I have some confidence in my function now. Now let's go on to look at figure 4.7a which is interesting, showing the black body curves of the sun and of the earth. So how much different in wavelength are the radiative peaks of the sun and the earth? 255 Kelvin to 5780 Kelvin. That's quite a bit. So let's code it up. In fact, we can probably start with what we've got here. And we need to change the temperatures to 5780, 255, and the colors I'm going to change to orange for the sun and to royal blue for the earth. Okay, let's run that and we might think, oh, that's going to give us exactly what we want. Well, it doesn't, but if we look a little more closely at the figure, we see that it goes up to about 100 microns. So we can increase that, our wavelength max, to 100 micron. Now we still don't look like the book figure. Why is that? Well, we need some more points. We know that because we're getting some choppiness here. I'm going to go with 10,000 just because it's not going to take very long to compute at all. 
and I'll see that's in steps. Okay, so it's a little bit smoother here, but we still see a very high peak here. We see nothing for the Earth, which doesn't seem right. And this looks much more compressed than in the book. So let's look more carefully at the book figure. Well, the y-axis says normalized. So we know that we're dividing these by their maximum. Okay, so now I see two curves. And I see a much narrower peak at much lower wavelengths for the sun, a broader peak at longer wavelengths for the Earth. That makes sense. And we've got a dimensionless label here, so let's go ahead and make that maybe a little bit more useful. I'll call it normalized radiation. Okay. But why doesn't it look like the book figure? Well, if we look very carefully at the scale between part A and B of the figure, you'll notice it's not linear. It's actually logarithmic. So, x dot set x scale to be log. Now I've got something that looks quite a bit more like the book. If I wanted to get even closer, I could set my w min to be 0 0.1. And yes, now we're very close to what we see in the textbook. But notice it took me a couple of steps just glancing at the figure. I might say, ah, well, the area under those curves is roughly the same. Uh, they've got a peak magnitude of about the same. And the Earth is very far shifted from the Sun. But by making the plot myself now, I understand that this is a normalized plot with a logarithmic X scale. So doing exercises like this, reproducing figures from books, is a great way to check your understanding, preparing for a test, helping teach a subject, or just to satisfy curiosity. I hope that you found this useful, and I'll see you on next week's Pie Monday.